This is the story of a man in Nazi-occupied Hungary who saved thousands of Jewish lives. Of a man who risked his life to negotiate face to face with the Gestapo. The story of Rudolf Kastner. Our saving was a miracle. Kastner was the greatest hero of the Holocaust because he gambled his life to meet day after day the Germans. Yet Kastner was a Jew, and some of his fellow Jews claimed he was a collaborator and traitor. He picked out his family and those he wanted to save. They were sent to Switzerland. The other 600,000 he passed over in silence. They were sent to Auschwitz and their destruction. The Gestapo allowed Kastner to choose nearly 2,000 people for a train journey to freedom. Kastner considered himself a hero. But after the war, many Israelis condemned him, and he was gunned down in the street. In Kastner's hometown of Cluj, people celebrate the arrival of a new garrison. In 1940, Hungarians were proud and nationalistic. They were also pro-German and anti-Semitic. The son of a moderately prosperous wine merchant, Rudolf Kastner was, at the time, an up-and-coming lawyer and journalist. He just wooed and married Boyo Fischer, the beautiful daughter of the richest and most influential Jew in town. But he also made enemies. He had the sort of razor kind of mind, you know, an analytic, cutting, and also sometimes cutting down people. There were some who did not like him because of his sometimes sarcastic approach, and he couldn't suffer fools was not a very tolerant person. Kastner's passion was politics. He was an energetic Zionist youth leader, more a fixer than a pioneer. He had made a name for himself as a man who could help Jews find their way around hostile government bureaucrats. There were all kinds of administrative things that needed some kind of help. You had to know how much and to whom to pay. And Kastner knew all the finesses, all the, all the uh, labyrinth of, that, of, of a sort of Byzantine uh, bureaucracy. And people knew that, so they went to him. He took upon himself a kind of representing the interest of the Jews, who was responsible, in a way, for the well-being of his community. But there was also a rather rakish side to Kastner. He was a born liar. He was a born adventurer. He was a person who could promise anything without having any backing for that. In 1944, Hitler summoned the Hungarian ruler, Admiral Horthy, to see him. Up to now, Horthy had been an ally. But with the advancing Soviet armies already close to the Hungarian frontier, Hitler ordered the occupation of Hungary. Many Hungarians were happy to cooperate with the occupying power. Hard on the heels of the troops came Gestapo officer Adolf Eichmann, who had already masterminded the deportation of millions. Within weeks, Jews were wearing the yellow star. Hungarian police and the Gestapo were arresting Jews and herding them into ghettos. However, Eichmann did not close down the Jewish Help and Rescue Committee, 
and allowed them to keep their offices in Budapest. The committee had been set up by Kastner. Eichmann's boss, Heinrich Himmler, was behind the decision to tolerate Kastner's organization. Himmler was pondering a very serious problem. By the spring of 1944, it was pretty obvious that uh, Nazi Germany was in deep trouble. I think that what Himmler wanted to do was to prepare options for Hitler to choose from. One such option was to get in touch with the Western powers. Himmler had his reasons for choosing a bunch of unknown and powerless Jews as a channel to the Western Allies. Kastner's committee, if they could show the Nazis that they were in contact with their brethren and sisters in the Allied countries, were in fact the representatives of the world Jewish conspiracy, an international power of the greatest uh, force. I mean, this idiocy was believed in. And so it's quite, uh, quite uh, logical for Himmler to have uh, tried to negotiate via people who pretended that they were representatives of that force. A few weeks after his arrival in Budapest, Eichmann summoned Kastner's colleague, Joel Brand, to his headquarters at the Hotel Majestic. Quite unexpectedly, Eichmann made the most extraordinary offer. When he was put on trial in Jerusalem after the war, his words were quoted by Joel Brand. Er hätte mich rufen lassen, um mir ein Geschäft vorzuschlagen. Er war bereit, mir eine Million Jut zu verkaufen. Wette für Mut, Mut für Wette. Das war sein Stimmfall damals. Eichmann was offering to release a million people for 10,000 lorries. This was really a ploy by Himmler to make contact with the British and the Americans. But Kastner's committee was interested in any chance to save lives. On the one hand, we were astonished. On the other, we had no alternative. There was absolutely no way we could turn such an offer down. So we accepted with hope, but also with suspicion. Suspicion because we feared that the offer was a trap or propaganda stunt. Joel Brand left Hungary to find out if the Western Allies were interested in Eichmann's approach. Kastner took over where Brand left off. He was assisted by Joel's wife, Hansi. In mid-May, Eichmann began to deport Jews to Auschwitz. 12,000 a day. Misinformation was widespread. The SS had told them they were going to a Hungarian work camp. Kastner knew where they were really going. And it was against this grim background that his negotiations with Eichmann began. Kastner, who was often accompanied by Hansi, had no experience of negotiating with an executioner. Who had? And yet the stakes were incredibly high. At the start of this extraordinary relationship, Kastner was intimidated by Eichmann's display of power. Hansi told Kastner to be more assertive. Kastner complained Eichmann smokes all the time when we're talking, and I have to sit there without a cigarette, which annoyed him terribly. Why, she said, get out your cigarettes and smoke with him. Kastner took Hansi's advice. Eichmann later commented, when he was with me, Kastner smoked cigarettes as though he were in a coffee house. 
While we talked, he smoked one aromatic cigarette after the other. He added maliciously, with his great polish and reserve, he would have made an ideal Gestapo officer himself. As he settled into his new role, Kastner began to negotiate more aggressively. Matters went so far that at one point Eichmann said, Mr. Kastner, you're taking too many liberties. I think I'll send you for a holiday in Auschwitz. Kastner and his colleagues knew that their lives hung by a thread. And as pressures grew, Kastner turned more and more to Hansi. They became lovers. They needed each other. She was Rudolf's counsellor. Sometimes he lost courage whilst negotiating with Eichmann, and small wonder. But she always sent him back into the fray. You must carry on. You can't give up now. From the moment the deportations began, Kastner told Eichmann repeatedly that if his offer to exchange Jews for lorries was serious, then some must be spared as a sign of goodwill. It was a dispiriting struggle, as Hansi Brand recalled during the Eichmann trial. Yet for all his obstruction and threats, Eichmann knew that Himmler wanted him to keep in with Kastner. So Kastner had some leverage. Eichmann then offered to release a token number. They could go by train to the Jewish homeland in Palestine. The question now arose, who should travel? How should we make the choice? Go into the ghettos and ask who wants to come? That would have produced uproar. We couldn't do it that way. The pre-war Jewish community in Hungary had been very diverse, and Kastner wanted the train to reflect this. It was, he said, to be a Noah's Ark. But the SS had demanded a thousand dollars per traveler. So the less affluent had to be funded by the richer travelers. After the war, many survivors of the camps were angry with Kastner, particularly those from Cluj, his hometown. They complained that he had neither selected them for his train, nor warned them about Auschwitz. In May, thousands of Jews had been crammed into the ghetto in the city's brickyard, part of which is still standing. Several people heard about the Kastner train and asked if they could join. A young Zionist, Moshe Gluck, was one. He was told there was no room. Gluck was among the last group in the ghetto to be deported. He believed the SS propaganda that he was going to a Hungarian work camp. We were taken to our train, but the others in the Kastner group stayed behind in the ghetto. We walked out carrying our little bags, and we said to them, Shalom, shalom, auf Wiedersehen. We are going to the work camp, and you're going to Palestine. Of course, we didn't go to the Hungarian work camp, but to Auschwitz. After Moshe Gluck left for Auschwitz, those in Cluj lucky enough to be on Kastner's list were brought to Budapest. So were groups from other Hungarian towns. On the morning of June the 30th, SS guards escorted Kastner's people 
to an isolated goods station. The stage was set for the most remarkable rescue attempt in the history of the Holocaust. After shuffling for 24 hours from one Budapest goods station to another, the Kastner train finally departed. Those who'd boarded couldn't be sure where the train was going. Ladislaus Devecheri decided only at the last minute to risk putting his family on the train. My feeling was that I was a barbarian. I knew I was taking a gamble. Either we'd die or we'd escape. There was no certainty. The one thing I was sure of was that staying in Hungary was much more dangerous. My sister and me Two young uh, teenagers. I was 15 years. My sister was 16 years. We were very naive, and uh, we believed that oh, we were very happy. We were traveling to to Palestine, but my father didn't trust the Germans, and he gave us uh, uh, cyanide pills to the way. Uh, that if we need it, it's better than to die in the hands of the Germans. The doors weren't closed, they were open, we had air. We had our food with us, there was room to sit down. There were all sorts of people on this train. There were artists, and there were uh, scientists, and there were religious leaders, and there were Polish refugees, and refugees from Slovenia, and orphans, and Zionists. Nearly 1,700 people were traveling on Kastner's Noah's Ark. Alarm spread among the travelers when, four nights after leaving Budapest, they were told that they would be stopping for showers. Some of Kastner's people knew that the gas chambers at the extermination camps were disguised as shower rooms. We arrived to the place that should be disinfection, but we didn't believe in it. We didn't know whether there will come water or poison gas. We had to pass naked before a doctor. It was very disagreeable to stand naked. I had nothing on me, just this string of pearls that I got from my husband on my last birthday. And it was a decisive moment. I thought it's a moment of life and death. And I decided he shouldn't see the time of it. He should see how a proud Jewish woman is going to die. And I looked into his eyes, straight into his eyes, like into the eyes of my enemy. I look at my father, yeah, uh, like a question, a mute question. What, what do we do now? If we take our pills, or not. He make us sign, not yet. So we stood naked, and there came water, not poison gas. We got our clothes back, it was already disinfected, and we returned to the train, and the train went on and on. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
but they still did not know where they were going. Eichmann thought there was little point in releasing Kastner's people when the Germans had so far received nothing in return. So he diverted the train northwards. After three days, the train stopped and everyone was ordered off again. They were locked up behind barbed wire, locked up for so long that one of them had time to draw pictures of their new prison, Bergen Belsen. Bergen Belsen was not an extermination camp, nor was it the disease-ridden hell it was to become a year later. At that time, it held people the Nazis might want to exchange or release. None of the group knew what would happen to them. Even though Budapest was now within reach of American air raids, a German defeat was far off. Eichmann was still pressing on. With amazing rapidity, he had already deported more than 400,000 to Auschwitz, more than half the Jewish population of Hungary. Kastner was desperate. In August, he wrote to a friend, after three and a half months of bitter negotiation, I feel I'm watching the unfolding of a tragedy which is quite unstoppable. Kastner turned to another SS officer whom he hoped would have a better chance of influencing Himmler. A man who probably had blood on his hands, but who was now busy looting Jewish property. Even Jews who met Obersturmbannführer Kurt Becker couldn't deny that he had style. Becher, a good aussehen the man. A good-looking man, attractive manner, very well-dressed and very friendly. Becher was living in the home of the richest Jew in Hungary. At first, Kastner was unsure how to handle him. He once came back from Becker's office with an admission. He told Hansi Brand that he'd not dared disturb Becker's birthday party. Hansi said, take him some chrysanthemums. If Becker accepts them, you will be able to speak freely. The gesture worked. This relationship was to become critical to Kastner's efforts. At the end of July, news seeped through to Budapest of the British rejection of Eichmann's Jews for Lorries offer. The Times dubbed it monstrous. Kastner hoped the Americans would be more flexible. He convinced Becher that he had the necessary contacts. Es war der Wunsch von Herrn Dr. Kastner mit der mit der mit den mit der jüdischen Seite in der Schweiz zu sprechen im Interesse, dass noch mehr und viel mehr erreicht werden konnte. Das war das Ziel von Dr. Kastner. Von Anfang bis zum Ende, er wollte erreichen, dass möglichst viele Menschen geschützt wurden. Right through 1944, Hitler's armies were being pushed back relentlessly. So Himmler's interest in making contacts with the Americans was now even greater, but his negotiating position was becoming weaker. Kastner konnte dann sagen, Kastner was able to say, Unless you make a convincing gesture, no further negotiations are possible. And the gesture he had in mind was releasing his people in Bergen-Belsen and sending them to Switzerland. Obviously, that argument was sufficiently convincing for Becker to pass it on to Himmler. At Bergen-Belsen, the camp authorities were ordered to divide Kastner's people into two groups. It was a very touching scene. 
A part of our family was in the first group. A part of them remained behind. My best friend remained behind. And we were already leaving. And behind their barbed wire stood the second group. A German high officer told us these persons were leave immediately Bergen-Belsen. We didn't know toward which destination. So we sang the Hatikva. The meaning of this word is to hope. The train headed south towards the Swiss border. An SS man came into our wagon and took everyone's papers and tore them up, including mine. And he said to me in German, you swine, now you're free, you'll fight against us. Ladislas Devacheri was traveling with 11 family members, including a sick toddler. Suddenly we saw Red Cross ladies and Swiss soldiers. And they said to us, you're still on German soil. Go down two more steps and you'll be in Switzerland. And that's how we became free. I was happy. I was incredibly happy. We were there. My little son, my husband, my parents, my grandparents, one of my uncles with his wife and his two sons. We were alive. On the day of the release, Kastner was actually standing on another part of the Swiss-German frontier at the first of a series of meetings he had set up for Becher. The climax was a secret rendezvous in a Zurich hotel in November, where Kastner and his contacts produced an American diplomat, Roswell McClelland, for Becher to talk to. McClelland offered no trucks, but he flashed a $5 million check, actually uncashable under Becker's nose. I don't think money was the purpose at all. What Himmler really wanted is to have a ceasefire, an agreement with the Americans to stop the war in Europe, to turn German might against the great danger of Bolshevism from the East, hopefully with American help. The Jews of Budapest were the only large group of Hungarian Jews still in existence. Himmler kept cancelling plans to deport them. He was anxious to maintain his contact with the Americans, brokered by Kastner. Although many were to starve or be killed by Hungarian fascists, over 100,000 were still alive when the Red Army later took the city. It was Kastner who had kept the Swiss talks going. He had absolutely no power to deliver anything. The negotiation was the purpose of the negotiation, because while the negotiation lasted, the, the Budapest Jews were in Budapest and not in Auschwitz. So he could have done anything only to have another day of postponement. He never thought for a moment that he can deliver on the part of the Allies any sort of goods or promises. All he wanted was to win time, and he did. I, I wouldn't sit here alive if he didn't. Those members of the Kastner group not released in August were still languishing in Bergen-Belsen with little prospect of escape. In early December, they were suddenly packed into an unheated passenger train. Kastner had told Becher that the Swiss negotiations could continue only if his people were let go. 
Kastner travelled to the German side of the Swiss frontier to make sure the train crossed. His family was on board. The train stopped near to the border. Suddenly, I heard the voice of Kastner shouting of my father, where are my darlings? Are they alive? He ran from wagon to wagon to look for his family and for his friends, and the Zionist leaders. My father told him that your wife is here. Kastner and his wife walked up and down talking with an SS guard two steps behind them. She then got back in, and the train crossed into Switzerland. He followed a few days later. Eva Später has the copy of the original German list of the two trainloads who were freed. 1,684 people in all. Kastner could have rested on his laurels, but he chose to leave Switzerland and go back to Germany to try and rescue more people. It was a tremendously heroic thing to do. Nobody forced him. He and his family were safe in Switzerland. To go back into that hell, he could gain nothing from it personally. With Germany close to collapse, Kastner's leverage had become very much stronger. Hitler had ordered that no concentration camp inmate should fall alive into Allied hands. Kastner began to pressurize Becher to save Jews in camps still under German control. Becher valued Kastner as a walking insurance policy for after the war. The two of them went to Bergen-Belsen. Conditions at the camp had changed quite dramatically since Kastner's people had been held there the previous year. The Menschen in, im Freien saßen auf der Erde, meines Erachtens kaum, kaum lebendig. Leichen und lebendige Menschen nebeneinander. Ein grauenhaftes Bild. Grauenhaftes Bild. Ich bin nach Hamburg gefahren mit Dr. Kastner. Ich habe mit Himmler telefoniert und habe ihm gesagt, es wäre dort ein grauenhafte Zustände. Grauenhafte Zustände. Himmler instructed Becher to ignore Hitler's order. He must try and save the prisoners and not fight the approaching British army. It is beyond any doubt that Kastner had a major role in rescuing the remnants of the starving and dying Jews in Bergen-Belsen. The fact that the Germans handed over Bergen-Belsen to the advancing British army is due to Becher, who told on behalf of Himmler, the German commanders there, to hand the camp over without any fight. Becher had Kastner with him at the time, and Kastner was constantly trying to persuade Becher to do more and more to rescue people. The closeness which developed between the two men during this period was to influence profoundly Kastner's destiny. We were friends. We were per du. We were geduld. I have not said Herr Kastner, but I have said Rudolf. When the war ended, Rudolf Kastner returned to Switzerland. Rather than looking to the future, he could not forget the past and what he'd achieved, saving nearly 2,000 lives and helping to save over 100,000 others. He was so full of himself, so convinced that his fantastic achievements made him a hero. Als ein Held consacriert. 
And I said, Rudolf, we're very happy that you've come back. But you must realize that things will not be easy for you in the future. Many Jews have died. But those few who did not will say, why did Kastner save one lot of people, but not our relatives and friends? After the war, the Kastners left Switzerland and moved to the Promised Land. Here, they could leave the horrors of Nazi persecution behind them and lead a normal family life. They were now parents and had been reconciled after his wartime affair with Hansi Brand. He was a very, very strict father, very demanding on one hand, and a loving and sporting father on the other. He spent relatively an awful lot of time with me, teaching me and playing with me balls and hide-and-seek and mind games. As soon as I started studying English at school, he taught me Hamlet's monologue by heart. I couldn't understand a word, but I could recite it. He scraped a rather precarious living as a journalist and broadcaster for the Hungarian Jewish community in Israel. But he was planning a political career. He believed he was of ministerial caliber. He had no illusions about his talents. He was quite sure, and absolutely self-assured. And since he thought that he did a very great and important thing uh, during the war, he thought that he should be awarded a political prize for it. But in the 50s, many Israelis would have been reluctant to award any prizes to Kastner. The Jewish pioneers who'd come to Palestine before the war, or who had been born there, believed that force rather than negotiation was the way to deal with enemies bent on their annihilation. That, after all, was how Israel had dealt with the Arabs. Indeed, the Israelis who'd built up Palestine before and during the war felt contempt for the Holocaust survivors now arriving. If it happened to us, we would have rebelled from the first moment. With arms or without arms, our bare hands, we would have been killed like heroes. Why all these Jews, millions, how could it happen that millions of people went to the pit to be shot or to the gas chambers without any resistance, and this intensified our contempt for the Jews. And this was a part of why we didn't want to hear about it, why we looked down upon the survivors who came here. Kastner was unaware how vulnerable he was, how his wartime actions could be misinterpreted. If Israelis were intolerant of Jews who had not resisted the Nazis, how much more antagonistic would they be towards a Jew who'd negotiated with the Gestapo? By 1954, Kastner was a government spokesman, and it was rumored he would be running for parliament as a Labour candidate at the next election. Labour, and in particular its leader, David Ben-Gurion, dominated Israeli politics. But Kastner's chances of advancement were suddenly jolted by a libelous article penned by Malchiel Grunwald, a shady figure on the fringe of right-wing politics. He accused Kastner of collaborating with the Nazis and of testifying in favor of Becher in Nuremberg after the war. At the time, the accusation seemed absurd. But the Attorney General decided the state should sue. And told them, I am not going to be accused of having a collaborator with the Nazis occupy a high position in the government of Israel. 
with doesn't go. Cohen thought the trial would be a walkover. Kastner looked forward to telling the public at last what he had achieved. He thought that he will appear there and he will explain the, his, his major uh, successes outside and he will appear in the, as the savior of so many, of so many people. And he believed that this is the opportunity. But two formidable figures hoped to use the trial to attack Ben-Gurion and the Labour government. Shmuel Tamir, Grunwald's attorney, was a very resourceful lawyer. Uri Avneri was an influential journalist. I was the editor of a news magazine which was in extreme opposition to the government. The government was Ben-Gurion. Uh, so we decided to draw attention to this trial. We, in our weekly magazine, we gave it as much exposure as we could. And I was there every day following it. The trial opened in 1954 in Jerusalem under Judge Benjamin Halevi. Tamir was quick to raise the question why Kastner had not warned his fellow Jews that they were going to be deported to Auschwitz. <laughs> Kastner argued that warning people who were in effect prisoners of the Germans would have caused panic. Tamir claimed that Kastner's silence had been bought. Tamir wrote many articles in Avneri's magazine during the trial. The impact was huge. Moshe Gluck, who'd been refused a place on Kastner's train, had lost his mother and both his sisters at Auschwitz. He compared Kastner with Joseph Mengele, the notorious doctor who'd met the deportation trains. Mengele, had in Auschwitz. Mengele used to make the selection at Auschwitz. He was the big boss, and he divided everyone up into those who lived and those who died. Kastner, to my mind, also made a selection. I remember the atmosphere at home getting thicker and thicker, and my father pacing practically the whole night through. And I lay awake for hours, and I heard him pacing toe and fro. Tamir then started to unravel Kastner's relationship with Kurt Becher. Tamir said, uh, you agree, Mr. Kastner, that the SS was a criminal organization? Of course. He said, do you agree that every uh, superior officer in the SS was a war criminal? Of course. He said, and do you agree that anyone who would help a superior SS officer must be a criminal? I think at that moment, Kastner started to realize this had got into a trap, but he couldn't get out of it anymore. He said, yes. And he said, then Tamir turned to the judge and said, may I have exhibit number so-and-so? And he said, oh, and he said, Mr. Kastner, do you know this document? And Kastner became very, very pale and he said, yes. Kastner had given an affidavit in favor of Becher to the denazification court in Nuremberg. He praised him as one of the few SS leaders who 
had the courage to oppose the program of annihilation. Kastner said privately that he'd done this to fulfill a promise he'd made to Becher. Helping a Nazi was bad enough, but Kastner had gone one step worse. Well, he came out as a liar, and he was cocksure that his lies would not be detected. Tamir's revelation about Becher was the turning point. It was now Kastner who was on trial. The public mood, egged on by Avneri's magazine, became ugly. When I heard that he had testified for Becher at Nuremberg, I said straight away, he'll get a bullet in the head. In June 1955, Judge Benjamin Halevi upheld the principal libels against Kastner. I returned from school and he called me and I just sort of stood next to him. The atmosphere in, in the house was so tense. You could cut the air with a knife. And he said to me that I will hear many bad things about him now, but I must always remember that he did his best to save as many Jews as he could. The judge concluded that in his view, Kastner had sold his soul to the devil. This caused an outcry. Shops refused to serve him. People spat in his face. One night, we took a walk outside the office, just a refreshing walk in the night. And the cat in the street overturned something that made noise, and Kastner jumped. And then I realized that he was really afraid that somebody would try to kill him. Kastner was gunned down outside his flat by an extreme nationalist gang on March the 15th, 1957. He died 12 days later. On the road between Tel Aviv and Haifa, there is the entrance to a rough track. At the end of it is the only memorial to Kastner in Israel. We have planted a forest in his honor. We tried in vain to have streets named in his honor. There are still a lot of enemies of Kastner living in Israel. Little attention was paid to the Israeli Supreme Court when it threw out the devastating verdict of the libel trial only a year after Kastner's death. But among those who have revised their opinion is the man whose campaign helped to destroy Kastner. Kastner was caught up in events which were uh, uh, so much bigger than a person, an ordinary person, or even a not ordinary person could handle. How can we judge what was right, what was wrong in, in such a situation, which we cannot even imagine? In the end, I must say, I tend towards Kastner. I don't believe that he was a traitor. You can find out more about Rudolf Kastner by going to channel4.com forward slash next step. And Secret History next Thursday will be an hour earlier at 8 o'clock, telling the unknown story of the British servicemen who serve, survived brutal mistreatment as prisoners of the Kaiser during World War I.